you done now? Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Oh, it can't be. Just sent you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know. You did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. You built a time machine? What about DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're gonna build a time machine into a car, why not do it some style? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time. It's the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. It is I. I hope everyone enjoyed their Thanksgiving week. I had a great break. I had a great break. I enjoyed myself. Went on a little road trip. Stayed safe, but I went on a little road trip and uh, really enjoyed my time away. But I didn't enjoy my time away from Back to the Future, the podcast, and all the pinheads out there. That's why we are back this week with a brand new episode. Today... I'm excited for this. One thing I wanted to do with this podcast was explore the history and the lore back to the future and go, you know, behind the scenes with certain things. And today we're going to do that. I'm going to explain what I mean in a minute. Um, But before I move on, it is the season of giving. It's the season of perpetual hope, as Catherine O'Hara once said in Home Alone. I don't know if it was one or two. I think it was one. Um, And I want to give something out to all the people. Uh, You know I have a book out, Back from the Future, A Celebration of the Greatest Time Travel Story Ever Told. And also Michael J. Fox has a book out this year, No Time Like the Future. Both of these books are available right now on Amazon.com. However, right now, you can win yourself a copy of both books from your man Brad Gilmore, your friend in time. I will autograph my book for you, and I will send you a copy of Michael J. Fox's book for free. Free 99. Doesn't cost you a thing but only one person can win this prize and it's going to go to the person and i think this is within the rules who goes over to amazon.com finds back from the future a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told and leaves a review for it um you know you you can uh preview it on amazon read through a couple pages and then give me a review five stars and a great review you will be automatically entered to win a copy of the book autographed by your boy and also a copy of Michael J. Fox's new book, No Time Like the Future, for absolutely free. So go do that right now on Amazon.com. I'm going to be looking for them over the next seven days. So by the by this time next week, uh, and I should have a winner that I will announce on the podcast. So please come back and listen if you are one of those few who go and do that. I hope everyone does it, and I appreciate you, and I will get those books out to you. But today... I have Jennifer Trotu on the podcast. Now, that name might not sound very familiar with you, with you or to you, but she is, you know, she's in charge over there at the Gamble House. The Gamble House is the house where Doc Brown's lives, where Doc Brown's family lived, the Brown family mansion in 1955, that beautiful, unique structure. That's where Doc Brown lived in the film Back to the Future. It's in Pasadena, California. I've gone and visited the Gamble House, and I'm sure many of you have before. So when I was there maybe two years ago, I said there's a lot of history here that I'm not aware of. And when I was putting together season seven of Back to the Future, the podcast, I decided to explore the history of some of these famous locations. We all know about the Universal Backlot and the Clock Tower and all the stuff that was filmed there. I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about the Gamble House. So I called up Jennifer. I said, hey, let's do the podcast. Let's learn all together about the cool things that the Gamble House has to offer. And I really want to encourage everybody to go over to the Gamble House's website and donate to the cause if you can, because it is an incredible piece of architecture in history and we need to keep it alive. But without further ado, here she is right now to talk about the Gamble House, Doc Brown's house. Miss Jennifer Trotu on Back to the Future, the podcast. And she joins me right now, Miss Jennifer Trotu, the director of collections and interpretation at the Gamble House. Jennifer, how are you? I'm great, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I'm excited to talk to you because the Gamble House is so iconic, right? I mean, I think that anybody who's seen Back to the Future, 
any number of times, even if you've seen it once, that house really sticks out to us. Um, I've been privileged to actually go to the house before, even though I'm in Houston right now. Uh, last time I was in L.A., Pasadena, I made sure to stop by and at least view it from the outside. But tell us about the Gamble House, a little bit what it is and, and what y'all have been doing recently. Well, the Gamble House was built in 1908 as a winter home for David and Mary Gamble of Cincinnati, Ohio. That's the uh, Gambles of the Procter & Gamble Company. And they built the house because they'd enjoyed visiting Pasadena for the winter several times and decided that they wanted to have a place to go every year. So they built the house uh, once they'd selected a site overlooking the Arroyo Seco and the mountains and the hills and uh, the valleys. And they chose as their architect, somebody who lived around the corner, um, Charles Green, and he and his brother, Henry Green, were in business together as the architecture firm known as Green and Green. So uh, that's what, that was the origin of the house. It was just meant to be enjoyed for several months during the winter uh, by a family who were had the right idea coming out from Cincinnati to stay in Pasadena. And, and okay, so w tell us a little bit about the architecture of the home because it's got such a distinctive look. As soon as you turn onto the street where the Gamble House is located, it doesn't take you very long to find it. I mean, it sticks out. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was the design idea? Do you know? Yes. So uh, the Gamble House is considered to be one of the best examples in the country of what we call arts, arts and crafts style architecture. Locally in California, we often speak of it as craftsman style architecture. So it's, um, you know, this is a movement that originated in England and they were trying to get people to sort of get back to the idea of the things that they lived with, whether it's their house or the objects in it, being closer to something handmade that they could relate to and that they could relate to the people who had made those objects. So um, the Gamble House is kind of that same idea, you know, on a, on a really kind of more luxurious scale uh, where Everything is supposed to relate to the landscape around it and relate to the craftsman who actually made it. So the, you know, the house is kind of famously, you know, covered in these brown shakes, which are, you know, naturally split uh, along the lines of the grain. And so they have this really rustic character to them. And so if you think about that landscape setting that the house had overlooking the valleys and towards the mountains and um, it being just a seasonal home, you can see how it was kind of a place that, that was just meant to be a very comfortable and relaxed kind of getaway. And it really is full of things that were made locally, but the materials that it has uh, are a lot of exotic hardwoods and things that came from Asia. And um, it, it really, the, the craftsmanship that was applied to those materials locally is what kind of where the magic is with the house. So it inside and out uh, has, you know, redwood and Douglas fir and teak from Burma and Santo Domingo mahogany, all these different woods um, from Oregon. There's Port Orford cedar in most of the upstairs. So it's this kind of symphony of all these different textures and colors and uh, grains of wood. And that extends from the house itself into the furnishings that were designed by Green and Green for the house as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, I, Because it's just one of those things to where when you see it, you obviously know there was thought. There was a lot of thought put into this design and the reasons that it was there. So it does seem like a very comfortable home for Mr. and Mrs. Gamble. Um, up until when did the Gamble family actually live in the house? They had the house for a long time. So they moved in and uh, around Thanksgiving time in 1909. And then um, the first uh, generation of the Gambles passed away in the 1920s. And then um, Mrs. Gamble's sister, who had always lived there with them, remained until her death. Uh, but the, the next generation of the family moved in. Uh, their older son, Cecil Gamble, and his wife, Louise, moved into the house in the late 1940s. So a second generation then made it their home. And they lived there full time, uh, not just in the winters. And they had it until 1966. So at that point, Cecil and Louise had passed away and they had six children and the children knew what the parents' wishes were. They knew that the house was really significant architecturally and artistically and they wanted it to be protected. So they ended up giving the um, house, uh, including you know the property, the house itself and all of the uh, furniture that was designed for it to the city of Pasadena so that it would be protected in perpetuity. Oh man, I see it. I always love when, when, when they've, bequeath it to the city so that we can continue to learn about uh, and, and uh, learn about the house and observe it and, and enjoy it. Um, how did you start working with the Gamble House? Yeah, it really, I mean, the other smart thing that I did, that they did that I should mention is that they put 
uh, the University of Southern California, USC's architecture department kind of in charge of stewarding the house. So the city wouldn't actually have to deal with it <laughs> and the city wouldn't have to worry about uh, the money or anything like that. So for about 54 years, we were under the direction of the USC School of Architecture. So during that time, a lot of very well-known architects came to stay in the house, to study the house, uh, generations and generations of students um, came to see it as well. And we've always had students living there uh, in, you know, up to today, we still have them, um, two students at a time living in the servants' quarters uh, so that the house is, you know, under um, some kind of a protective eye all the time, which is really helpful to us, too. Um, but that relationship with the School of Architecture helped to kind of solidify the reputation of the house, uh, you know, among architects and design enthusiasts and all that. So today we're, we're now newly operated by um, something called the Gamble House Conservancy, uh, that was established just specifically to protect the house and will continue to work with architecture departments of various schools of architecture around town. Oh, that's incredible. So did you come to the house as a part of, you know, the architecture program or how did you get your involvement with the Gamble House? I didn't. Um, I uh, have had a career in historic preservation for over 20 years. And when I came to the Gamble House, it was the first time, you know, in, after having worked on a project by project basis, getting a lot of houses uh, protected and restored over the years and a lot of office buildings and college campuses and all kinds of historic resources. I was really lucky to be able to come to the Gamble House and just really put my heart and soul into this one place and really, uh, you know, get to know it as much as I could and, um, you know, be really involved in it's the way that it's shown to the public, which is something that I'm really passionate about. What are some of the other historic homes or buildings that you've worked on? Anything that we may have heard of? Uh, yeah, actually, here's an interesting one. The um, what's known as the Standard Hotel in downtown Los Angeles is a, a really interesting place that, you know, it was a 1950s office building and nobody was paying attention to that kind of property at all. And one day at our, you know, at the office, we got a call saying, you know, I think I'm kind of interested in that building and I want to buy it. And it's been empty for 25 years. And, and I said, wow, I didn't think that anybody else had noticed that building <laughs> besides me. And so that was, you know, the start of a very long project that finally ended up, uh, you know, it was supposed to be kind of a run of the mill hotel. And then he was able to, uh, um, te team up with a much more interesting developer. And so that building really got the kind of architectural attention that it needed and it also made it into a really exciting place that was kind of a catalyst for uh fun things happening in downtown los angeles so that was a that was a terrific project to be involved in awesome so i of course became aware of the gamble house like so many from the film back to the future um it's mm -hmm. doc brown's quarters in 1955 hill valley um how did the filmmakers, you know, Universal, Robert, you know, uh, Bob Gale, Robert Zemeckis, how did they find this house? You know what? I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Oh, that's sorry fine. To say. Yeah. I think there's somebody out there who knows that, 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 that answer, but I don't. Um, but, you know, the, it, it's funny because this was the only time really that the Gamble House has ever been used for production like that. So we were just really lucky that 35 years ago, you know, somebody allowed that to happen and then that it was a movie that just really hit a nerve with popular culture that lasted so long. Um, but I don't really know what the origin of the relationship was. Um, but, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, it's just the exteriors that were used for the movie. Uh, and then the interiors were filmed at another uh, uh, green and green house that's not too far away. And if you want to get into that. Yeah, no, <laughs> tell us about that. So I always thought that the the because there's a there's a famous scene in the first film where Doc's talking to Marty in front of a beautiful fireplace and mantle. So that's not right. at the Gamble house itself. That's right. That's actually a, another house called the Blacker House, which is uh, a private residence still. And that one is. It's a huge house. It's like twice the size of even the Gamble House. And um, it's located over in the Oak Knoll neighborhood of Pasadena. And it was completed just a year before the Gamble House. So it's very similar in terms of the materials that they use and the kind of motifs and the, all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, for the trained eye, you can see immediately, wait a minute, that's not the interior of the Gamble House. So what is it? A lot of people wondered if it was a stage set uh, that they built. And it was not, it was actually this other house that they were able to use because it's not treated as a museum like the Gamble House is. So they were lucky to have that kind of alternate uh, place to, to film. Now, the they did film 
as I said, the exteriors at the Gamble House, but um, the garage of the Gamble House that figures prominently throughout the whole thing, because it sort of survives the house even, um, that was, uh, the interiors of that were actually built, uh, those were a stage set. So that was not uh, filmed in the in interior of the Gamble House, as um, Gamble House Garage. Of course, the Gamble House Garage is much smaller than Doc's workshop is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's, it'd be hard to build a time machine there, I guess. But, but, yes. <laughs> were you, so back in 2015, it's almost now five years ago to the day where we had the uh, Back to the Future day, the actual day yes. in the future. Were you at the Gamble House during that time? I was not. That was before I worked at the house. I was actually a docent at the house at the time. But the funny thing was that when the announcement came out, it was sold out just instantly. So many Back to the Future fans were right on it. And so all the a lot of Gamble House people were saying, well, wait a minute, why can't we come to that? We, you know, This is our house. You know? And uh, a lot of people had to be excluded, unfortunately, because it was so popular and word got out so quickly with Back to the Future fans. And that was really a day for them. You know, that was really uh, a, a chance for us to kind of celebrate that part of, uh, of the house's legacy that, you know, certainly nobody looked forward to in 1908, but uh, <laughs> has been, you know, something that's become so important to us since then. So that was, I, you know, I've seen pictures from that day and video from that day. And I know that it was uh, uh, something that, you know, we'd like to happen regularly just because it's, it's you know, it really kind of it reinforces people's relationship to the house and just makes it a fun place for everybody to gather. Yeah, I, I remember. Th I remember the day. Obviously, I wasn't there at the Gamble House, but I just remember seeing all those pictures and videos from that event that that you all had. And it, you know, everyone was in cosplay. There were DeLoreans going up and down the street. I mean, it really yeah. seemed like the place <laughs> to be. Um, how many like Back to the Future fans do you come in contact with, or does the house come in contact with? Because I would assume that there, it's a regular thing that people want to come see the Gamble House because of the film. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's very common for us to just be out in the front and sort of chat with people who've come by. And a lot of them will tell us that they're there because of Back to the Future. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people also just sort of have people who are interested in architecture and love Back to the Future. Those <laughs> those people really uh, find us uh, pretty quickly. But, um, you know, there's a lot of times where, uh, like, for example, we had a um, we had an exhibition at the house of uh, Japanese joinery um, that had come over from Japan and these examples of joinery that, it, that it were on display in the house. And so this was a kind of a specialized exhibition that we had going on. And we had opened it up for uh, a few nights during the exhibition so that people could come in the evening and have a glass of wine and see the exhibition. And uh, there was a couple who, you know, we were kind of chatting with them. So what brought you out to see the show? And they said, oh, we had no idea it was going on. We just came because of Back to the Future. And they were having this wonderful experience of seeing the show of Japanese joinery and having a glass of wine out on the terrace in the evening, you know, just things that they never would have dreamed of. Um, it was kind of like the ultimate fan experience. It wasn't even planned for fans. But, um, you know, sometimes people get lucky and, uh, you know, they come to the house for one reason and they, their mind is just opened up to all these other incredible things that we have to offer. So we especially love it when that happens. Now, were you a fan of the film? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was a teenager when the first one came out. So I was right smack in the uh, in the in the enthusiasm for it the first time around. And of course, you know, I grew up in Pasadena, so I certainly recognized the Gamble House and was very excited to see the Gamble House. And, you know, I'm one of these people who's been like kind of like a, a child architecture buff since a very young age. So I always had a, uh, you know, a spot in my heart for the Gamble House. And that makes it all the more exciting for me to be working there today but you know to have seen it in the in the film when i was a teenager that was big stuff <laughs> right i'm sure it was now now in your work obviously this year has been an odd year for so many people in so many industries um yeah. what has the gamble house been doing during this time where you can't really hold these art exhibitions yeah, I mean, you know, normally our, our, our sort of day-to-day -day activity is hosting people for um, tours of the interior of the house. And most of our tours, you know, we do about 45 tours a week normally uh, that are one-hour tours of the house. And we'll have anywhere from, you know, two or three people on those up to uh, 12 or 15. So that's kind of our, our usual activity. And that's all done by Gamble House docents who, you know, we have a squad of about 140 people who are regular docents for us. Uh, that we train over a period of many months. 
But, um, you know, since we can't do those interior tours right now, we just sort of retooled that information and brought in a lot of other information about the landscape of the house and the exterior of the house and the gardens. And we wrote a new tour um, called Gardens and Gables, Exploring the uh, Gamble House Outdoors. So we've been retraining our docents who are very eager to come back and be back at the house. Um, we, we have trained them to give this new tour that's given to one household at a time, uh, four days a week. And so now we're doing about 12 tours a week. And then we also have another tour that we do once a week that's uh, of the, the neighborhood of the Gamble House that um, goes to about 10 other green and green houses. Okay, so y'all be, y'all figured it out. Y'all y'all been somewhat pandemic proof for, yeah, for right I mean, now. We've got we've got ways for people to ex- explore the house and discover the house uh, in person. But we've also done a lot of work to try to get things online, get our lecture series online, do little short videos inside the house about different aspects of it. Um, so we're still working on those kinds of programs as well, just to uh, be able to reach. And you know, the nice thing is that now we can reach people not only who can come to the house physically, but uh, people who are all over the country or all over the world who can access those programs, um, you know, digitally. So we're really pleased to be expanding uh, our offerings that way. So I, um, okay, so I didn't get to go inside the house when I was there. I just saw the oh. exterior, but but <laughs> my, my, my girlfriend's a real estate agent. And sometimes I just go with her to these homes, these big homes we have here in Houston, because I'm, uh-huh. I'm a nerd in the sense of, I want to see if like what's cool about the house. Like, is there a secret passageway from the study <laughs> to the kitchen? Or is there something under the stairs? You know, I'm one of those people who like that. I'm still a kid at heart. Um, and I love film houses. Like, I even love another Christopher Lloyd house from uh, 1985's Clue. There's this big, beautiful mansion oh. from Clue the movie. I don't know if you've ever seen that one, but it's awesome. I haven't. Okay, so you need to check that out. I think that you would like yeah. it. But is there, is there so. anything, what's the most interesting room or or fact or hidden passageway or what what can you tell us about the gamble house along those lines well first i should mention that um we do have online as part of our offerings now a virtual tour so before you had to go in there with a with a docent and take the tour uh, unless we were having a special event where you could just go to a reception style kind of visit but now you can go to our virtual tour and you can just self-guide throughout the entire house So you can go all over all the rooms, you can look up close at all the objects and um, see all kinds of different things from vantage points that you wouldn't get if you were even on the tour yourself. So that's a really fun thing that people can do right now that'll always be on our website for people to explore. Um, So the virtual tour is there for them. But um, I have actually kind of thought about adding to the virtual tour little peeks behind the scenes like that. Um, There are some, there's two compartments in the house uh, that were meant to sort of hide your valuables. So you could go up and if you pressed on a particular part of the paneling, if you knew where it was or slid over a little lever or something like that, you could get into a little compartment. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fun. But the funny thing is that, um, you know, it would have just blended in with the paneling in when the house was new. But I, I think that what probably happened is in the 70s and 80s when there were a lot of students around and, and they weren't quite so precious about the way the house was treated in those earlier days. And so there's all kinds of like fingernail marks on those right now. <laughs> it kind of gives it away. You know, it's like you come and you look around the room and you can see where, you know, decades of people have kind of pawed at that spot in the woodwork. And it's like, hmm, I wonder what's. what's <laughs> so that's all, you know, it's kind of, it kind of blew the cover, I think. But, but there are those two little uh, secret compartments, one in the Gamble's bedroom and another in a guest bedroom. Uh, there's also a closet under the stairs that we're all very fond of that, um, you know, like more beautiful than any closet in your house, believe me, or my house, certainly. <laughs> um, so you, you open up this beautiful peak door under the staircase and there's board and batten paneling inside of this um, closet. And so that's the kind of paneling where, you know, it's like a wide board, maybe like a foot wide. And then there's little strips of wood that kind of cover the, uh, the joints between all those panels. Um, and it looks like it's a beautiful little room in there. If you cleared out all the audio equipment and put down a little oriental rug and a little chair and, you know, it's got a little, uh, you know, a nice little light in it. Um, so it's actually kind of a cozy little, uh, you know, Harry Potter should be so lucky kind of closet. And <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, um, now, OK, so you have the hidden compartments. Now, as far as what's on the interior, you said in the virtual tour, you can see all kinds of little objects and whatnot. How like was the house preserved? In the, in the same way that it was left as far as what was on the interior? These are all things that the Gambles actually use themselves? 
Yes, absolutely. We have um, an almost complete, pretty much complete set of furniture that Green and Green designed for the house. So every room that you see the furniture in, that's the room that it was actually designed and made for. Um, we also, in addition to that, we have uh, rugs that Green and Green designed in the living room uh, from that you know were made in um, the Czech Republic, what's now the Czech Republic in Bohemia, uh, for the house. Uh, we have a lot of the two generations of the Gamble families, um, you know, dishes and uh, silverware and glasses and that kind of thing. So uh, we have a lot of art objects that they had collected. We have things like, you know, a beautiful um, Tiffany mirror with peacock feathers around the edge and um, a Tiffany fern bowl that they had. Uh, in the house that we now have in the middle of the dining table. So there's a lot of, um, you know, the Gambles were not flashy people, but they had good taste and they liked things that were well-made. And so just those few little objects that they had that really made the place special, uh, a lot of those were left with the house. Um, so we were really fortunate to kind of inherit those from the family and um, have them under our care today. So there are a lot of things that we've received as later gifts. Uh, we actually have kind of a lot of Tiffany glass that's been given to us over the years. Um, but those ones that are particularly associated with the house that we know the family used and enjoyed while they were there and that we can see in the historic photos, those are especially um, precious to us. Now, as with, I only have a couple more things for you because, and you've been so appreciative with your time, or I appreciate your time rather, but two more things I want to ask. With all these older kind of houses, there's always stories, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's stories of, of the pre previous owners, and then there's stories of the previous owners maybe never really leaving the house. Has anybody <laughs> there ever experienced any sort of phenomena, be it you know spiritual or otherwise, at the Gamble House? Yes, and I'm not sensitive to that, but people who are sensitive to that can feel that, and they usually uh, tell us that and the person we know is Aunt Julia, who is a woman named Julia Hugens, who was Mrs. Gamble's youngest sister. Who um, She was part of the family. She lived with them and helped to raise the children and all that. And she had her uh, special bedroom and her own sleeping porch uh, overlooking the Arroyo Seco. And so she had a pretty good situation there. And a lot of people do say that Aunt Julia never really left. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes you know, these things kind of build on themselves and people hear that story. And then when they go there, they say, oh yeah, I can feel it. But sometimes people, honestly, who've never heard the story will come in and say, um, about that bedroom over there and they'll kind of feel a presence there. And, you know, Aunt Julie is a lovely person and I don't think anyone's ever felt threatened by her. Um, but, uh, you know, people just feel that, you know, she's just sort of there as this kind of, you know, just, you know, a presence is really the best way to describe it, that someone who is still there kind of watching over the house and, uh, you know, is, has kind of staked out her place there. And, um, you know, I know some people have felt that very strongly. Oh, that's awesome. OK, well, I got to definitely check that bedroom out next time I'm in Pasadena. Um, and, and Jennifer, tell the people how all of us Back to the Future fans and fans of architecture the worldwide, how can we support the Gamble House to keep everything that y'all are doing going and to keep the Gamble House here until the end of time? Well, you know, we I really appreciate your asking that. Um, at our website, gamblehouse.org, there's all kinds of things for you to explore, including a donate button. <laughs> and uh, we are very happy to have donations at this time, uh, especially. You can also become a friend of the Gamble House, which will kind of get you extra access to information about what's going on and special prices on events and things like that. It'll get you a discount in our bookstore, which does include Back to the Future merchandise. You can get to that through gamblehouse.org. And, um, you know, it'll kind of keep you up with what's happening uh, at the house as we're going through the, you know, transition, hopefully back to getting people in there and um, planning events in the future. Uh, so we really want people to be able to keep track of what's happening and to be able to support us in whatever the way they can, whether it's just uh, by word of mouth or whether it's actual donations uh, in cash, which we really could use right now, of course. Um, so, yeah, it, it's just there's all kinds of ways to support the Gamble House. And, um, you know, that's the, the website is really the, the best hub for that. All right. Well, make sure everyone go do it. Y'all make sure y'all give a donation over there to thegamblehouse.org. And uh, we'll put all the information in the description. Jennifer, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm happy to do it, Brad. I always love to talk about the movie. And, you know, I love to talk about the house. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much.
a big shout out to Miss Jennifer Trotu over there at the Gamble House. I hope you learned a little something interesting today on Back to the Future, the podcast, because that's what we're out here to do. Document the history of the greatest time travel story ever told. Make sure you go over to Amazon and leave a review for my book, Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told, and you are automatically entered to win a copy of the book autographed by me and a copy of Michael J. Fox's new book, No Time Like the Future. Until next week, my name is Brad Gilmore. This is Back to the Future, the podcast. And we will see you in the future.
Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Oh, Brad, what have you done now?